This is your 20-minute podcast, where we do our best to give you useful information in 20 minutes or less. Today's podcast is brought to you by Audible. Get a free audiobook download and 30-day free trial at audibletrial.com forward slash your 20-minute podcast. Over 180,000 titles to choose from for your iPhone, Android, Kindle, or MP3 player. Now, here's your host, David Brower. Hi, this is David Brower with your 20-minute podcast, and our special guest today is John Vespasian. He's the author of eight books about rational living. Hey, John, how are you? Hi, David. Thanks for having me on. You are very welcome. Uh, Where do you live? Where are are we talking from? I'm talking uh, from uh, from Europe, from the Netherlands, so it is uh, six hours uh, ahead of New York. Okay. Yeah, I'm in uh, Colorado. It's two o'clock in the afternoon, my time. Good. So very good. So you can go to bed after this, right? Uh, yes, a bit later. Yes, I will. <laughs> <laughs> well, you've got, uh, as I said, eight books on rational living. How did you How did you get started in these kinds of conversations? What was your What was your epiphany or life lesson that got you here? Well, what um, What initially uh, drove me to write was pure frustration. I have to say, frustration and irritation, because for many years, I mean, for decades, I have been an avid reader of um, uh, personal development books, philosophy, psychology, history. At a certain point, I grew very dissatisfied with the books I could uh, find in the market because I found it very unrealistic, very much uh, fluffy and uh, vague and imprecise. And I thought, okay, maybe I can can do a bit better than this. And I started to write uh, the kind of books I want to read, which is very, very much uh, practical, based on facts, based on history. I'm very much um, in favor of rationality. Wow, that's uh, that's terrific. I was uh, just by glancing through the titles. I mean, two of my favorites were uh, "Thriving in Difficult Times: Twelve Lessons from Ancient Greece to Improve Your Life Today," and of course, the other one was "When Everything Else Fails, Try This." What was your very what was your first book? Uh, first book is um, "When Everything Fails, Try This." Um, The pattern, the the thread uh, that goes through all my books is the idea that uh, if you try to take rational decisions, to look at problems and to look at challenges and trying to think logically, usually you will do much better in the long term, although it's very difficult. And the the whole purpose of my books is to try to to become a bit more rational, maybe 1%, maybe 2% more rational, because this makes a dramatic difference in the long term. Because in most cases, I would think we're more emotional than we are rational, right? We are both. As human beings, uh, we have an irrational component because to a certain extent uh, we're animals. Uh, We tend to panic. We tend to become very much upset when we don't get uh, our way. Uh, Sometimes we become depressed, we become anxious, we become stressed. And this is unavoidable. Uh, But what I'm trying to propose and we're trying to to analyze, because all my examples are drawn from from history, from, from real cases, from biographies, we're trying to propose is um, different ways to become a bit more rational and to make better decisions in your business and private life. Well, let's talk about the historical piece. Obviously, you're uh, you love history and you've done a lot of research throughout history to make some of these books happen. How did history become such an important part of your process? Uh, well, because. Um, in a way, I dislike history, I have to say, because uh, I read a lot. I read uh, economics, uh, marketing, uh, history, I mean, all kinds of stuff. But I have to say, most historical books are very much boring in, a, in the sense that uh, they focus on the facts. They tell you this and this. They tell you the story, but they don't draw a conclusion. So they just tell you that there was a king and a queen and there was a battle and there was a war. But uh, you don't learn anything from that. It's just pure facts. So the, the kind of history I like is, uh, is the human side of history where you can actually learn principles from the stories. So the, 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 the type of uh, history I actually use in my books uh, of biographies and anecdotes is based on the, um, a specific events and a specific uh, attitudes and decisions where you can actually learn something. The rest, I think, is just um, a noise. What a great idea to make it factual, historical personal, usable, relatable. I mean, that's quite, uh, you don't often find the commonalities between all those subjects. Yes. uh, Another uh, point that I really underline in my books is um, the dangers of uh, positive thinking. And this is something that uh, I think that makes my books rather rather different from the mainstream of uh, personal development books, 
because I try to propose uh, solutions, approaches, attitudes, and patterns that do not require huge uh, psychological involvement. In the sense that if you have a problem, uh, whether it's a business problem or a dating problem or romantic or health, I think it's much better to use the energies you have uh, when going through a difficult situation to try to find practical solutions, to try to find approaches that have proven uh, successful in the past. I think it's much better than to try to become artificially cheerful and artificially enthusiastic. And I think to recommend uh, positive thinking to people who are sometimes in a very bad situation, I think is cruel. I think it's um, inappropriate. And most of the time is a waste of time. That makes perfect sense because if you blow a positive attitude out of proportion, all of a sudden you're not being authentic, you're not being honest, you're not dealing with the, the real issues at, at hand, and you're just kind of camouflaging everything, aren't you? Yes, you are. And um, self-delusion is, uh, is very dangerous. I analyze in my books uh, not only positive examples, but also very negative examples. I mean, people who made huge mistakes in their lives and who, um, in the short term, they seem very successful, but in the long term, um, they really, uh, I mean, they, they blew it up. So what I try to do is to, uh, to look at the facts and to try to, to see patterns. And I use uh, examples from recent history, examples from uh, medieval history, from ancient history, because human nature has remained essentially the same for, uh, for the last uh, century, for the last, actually, say, 1,300 uh, um, years. Because when we read uh, the ancient Greek philosophers or Egyptians or Romans, we see they have exactly the same problems. The, they tried the different approaches. And what is really regrettable is that people today we still make the same mistakes over and over again because we don't bother to learn from history. Absolutely. And I'm fascinated by just the, the brief descriptions here that you have for each book. It really cuts to the chase to let you know what the book's about, how it's going to help you, how the history takes an active place. And having stories of success and failures, I think, is really healthy for people to understand. Yeah, especially when... Um, when we get uh, so much distracted from the media, because sometimes I get the question, oh, why do you use uh, historical examples? Why don't you use examples from, uh, from the newspapers? Because we don't have perspective. And one of the messages uh, I really underline in my books is that if you want to make good decisions and if you want to really be sure that uh, you are going in the right direction, you have to take at least the perspective of a lifetime. Not one year, not uh, one decade, not two decades. You have to look in your whole uh, lifetime. You're going to live, uh, say, 90 years, 95 years, 100 years, perhaps. You have to see what you want to achieve. There is enough time uh, to do very difficult and very challenging things, but you have to take the right perspective because if you look only in the short term, you will do one foolish uh, thing after the other. And if you look into the very, very long term, like uh, centuries, it's completely useless because, I mean, you will never live uh, for centuries. And uh, you will have no idea what, um, what is going to come after you. But uh, look, making decisions in terms of professional decisions, business, uh, romantic, health decisions, in terms of a lifetime, uh, estimating that you're going to live normally, say, 90 years, I think most of the time is going to work beautifully. Let me give our listeners just an example of one of your books here. It's called Rational Living, Rational Working. And the description you have says, are you trying to live rationally and facing all kinds of difficulties? How do you deal with people who won't listen to logical arguments? How should you react to situations of massive unfairness? This book provides practical advice on how to live rationally and maximize your chances of happiness in every situation. Amongst others, it will show you how to minimize stress and maintain your peace of mind, benefit from the advantages of nonlinear thinking, avoid short-sighted decisions, and increase your resilience during times of adversity. Each chapter contains real-life examples of individuals who have used reason to surmount obstacles, solve personal problems, and recover from setbacks. The ideas presented in this book will help you make better decisions, increase your effectiveness, and enjoy the benefits of rational living. And that is amazing, and that's only one of your eight books. Yes, uh, this book um, in particular contains the story of uh, Bobby Fischer, uh, who was a, a world uh, chess champion. Right, right. Uh, he blew it up completely. I mean, he was a really brilliant guy. I mean, when you see his uh, style as a, as a chess player, he was really logical. He was structured. He was, he was absolutely brilliant. 
But at a certain point, uh, he blew uh, he blew it up completely because he destroyed his life. I mean, he he started to fight with the with the chess federation, with the World Chess Federation, discussing about the rules, huh? just to play um, uh, when he has to play uh, for the for his title uh, on the next uh, four years. He started to to discuss. I mean, some really detailed uh, rules, really minutia, and he was so upset that he actually quit uh, playing chess. He really uh, got in, in problems with the with the U.S. government. Then he violated the embargo on, on, I think it was on Serbia. He went to play um, a chess match on one of these countries that was on, under embargo from the U.S. So immediately he got on the list of the FBI. Uh, then he, he got an arrest warrant. He was arrested in, uh, in Japan. Then he was uh, exiled into uh, Ireland. I mean, in, uh, into Iceland. It was a complete, a complete disaster. I mean, a guy who was really on top of the world. He was making a very good income. He was getting uh, sponsorships uh, from all sides. And he blew it up completely because he, and, and I analyzed why he actually uh, made such a disaster, because this is the point of the book. How is it possible that a guy who is so rational, so well prepared, so structured, destroys his life completely by making mistake after mistake? I mean, he really destroyed his life. Uh, it was really a pity because he was really a genius. But the problem and, and the, the solution is that uh, he never really spent enough time trying to get a balanced uh, personality. Because for years and years, he quit school, he concentrated, he played chess and he played chess and he studied chess and he became a genius at uh, playing chess. But he never really had time to study philosophy or history or psychology. And he was a bit uh, unbalanced. And this is what uh, made him very emotional. He made these uh, stupid mistakes that uh, they are very, very uh, strange uh, when you see that he was a very a structured chess player. But the, the, the amazing part of the story is that uh, when the guy really was in exile in Iceland, in a small island in the Atlantic, he has spent all his time in a second-hand bookshop reading books about history and philosophy and psychology because this is what he was missing. He was missing this uh, balanced personality, this knowledge, this general um, uh, education. And the message is that if you don't want to repeat this kind of mistake, you have to get this, uh, this balance in your life. You have to get this general education because otherwise, I mean, if Bobby Fischer made uh, these kind of mistakes, we also make this kind of mistakes. So we have to prevent those because they are very expensive and very difficult to recover from. Wow, what a great story. I, I'm beyond intrigued about that one book alone. So you've written a book almost, it looks like every year, it looks like you took 2011 off, but from 2009 to 2016, you came out with a book once a year. That That's pretty disciplined. Yes, I'm a super uh, organized writer. And I'm uh, now writing the next one that will come out uh, at the end of this year. Will come, I think, September, October 2017. And you have to be very organized. You want to produce uh, books, at least the kind of books I write, because they take a lot of uh, research. And you have to really research uh, a lot of stories. You have to put uh, the information together. And writing is relatively easy because I'm quite uh, fluent at writing. But editing takes months because I, I can write the first draft uh, very quickly. But then sometimes I have to go through the book uh, four, five, six, seven times until uh, it's really uh, easy to read. Do you have an editor that works with you? I have a reader uh, who is going to read uh, the result of my editing because I prefer to edit myself. But yes, I do, I do use uh, one or two external readers uh, to see the final, uh, the final cut, the final edit. That makes sense, yeah. But it really takes me a huge amount of time to edit my books. I would love to be uh, the kind of writer who can just uh, write it the first time and it would be perfect, but I am far from that. Yeah, I, we're all far from that. <laughs> we're all far from that. I do audio books from time to time, and and um, I got so frustrated with myself in trying to edit the audio books that I hired a friend of mine to edit them, and then that way he would edit the books, and then I can listen to it, he can listen to it, and we'd have, not unlike you, have at least two sets of eyes and ears, in my case, to make sure that the product was going to come out the way the client needed it to be. So I totally understand what you're talking about. I edited my first audio book, and I thought I was going to drive myself crazy because I'm such a perfectionist. I was defeating my own purpose. Yes, um, this is perfectly true. And another point I really uh, underlined in my books is that uh, whatever profession and whatever um, venture you are in, you really have to get a feeling for the numbers. And you have to get a feeling for how much time it takes to do something. Uh, how often are you going to fail? Because you are going to fail. Uh, you, there is always a learning curve. Right. Uh, how much effort? How much effort it takes uh, to promote your work? How much effort it gets? Uh, you need to uh, to get new customers. 
And you have to get the feeling for the numbers, because if you don't get uh, this experience, this uh, feeling for the numbers of your specific uh, business, you are going to be very unrealistic, uh, very frustrated, and you are going to quit uh, before, the, before it's time, because nobody is going to tell you right away uh, what the numbers are. You, sometimes you have to find it for yourself, but you have to get to learn the numbers. Otherwise, you will never get to the point where you can run your business smoothly. That makes absolutely perfect sense. Otherwise, you're you're living in a dream world and you're not operating on on anything rational or logical or practical. Yes, absolutely. And um, I would just to, I would just to mention was um, another point in my books, which is um, I very much recommend people to avoid uh, a stupid risk. I'm not uh, the kind of uh, author who says, "Ah, oh, you just have to do it. Go for it. Uh, go for it. You just can do it." I mean, I'm very much uh, a prudent um, a guy uh, by experience, and I think that uh, it's always good to keep a good margin of safety, whatever you're doing, because you are going to make mistakes. Even if you are very good at what you right. do, you're going to make mistakes. So it's better not to put all your eggs in your own basket. Always keep um, good uh, cash reserve for bad times and try to avoid uh, extreme situations because my, my study of history and, and really hundreds of, of biographies uh, shows that most people who become successful, they don't really take a lot of risk. They try to find the shortest cut to success. They try to find a way which is, uh, has high probabilities of success. They are persistent, but they are not foolish. This is an, an image that you will not get from the media. You will not get from movies. But in reality, if you try to avoid extreme risk, uh, you will do much better in the long term. Boy, that makes perfect sense, John. Hey, I want to thank you so much for your time. How can people get these books? Uh, it's very easy to find my stuff, my books, and my blog, and, and uh, all my um, interviews. Very easy to find. You just type my name on Google, uh, John Vespasian, and you will find everything immediately. Very good. And Vespasian, folks, is V-E-S-P-A-S-I-A-N. John, thank you so much. Uh, what a treasure to be able to talk with you and, and learn more about these books. I'm going to get on your website and. Uh, order one of them for sure, because I'm very curious. Are, do you have any of them available on uh, Amazon or any audiobooks, or are they just available through your site? Uh, they are all available on Amazon. They are in also Barnes & Noble. They are also available on Kindle, so they are very easy to find. Huh? Perfect, perfect. John Vespasian, the author of eight books about rational living. Thanks so much, John. Have a, have a good rest of your week. I appreciate your time. Many thanks, David. You bet. You've been listening to your 20-minute podcast, and we want to thank again our very great guest, John Vespasian, and we hope you enjoyed it as well. Be sure to like us on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash your 20-minute podcast. Until next time, don't forget to download your free audiobook at audibletrial.com forward slash your 20-minute podcast. That's audibletrial.com forward slash your 20-minute podcast for your free audiobook. And thanks for listening to your 20-minute podcast with David Brower.